to World Energy Week Live. Uh, for those of you who didn't see me before, I'm Angela Wilkinson, Secretary General and CEO of the World Energy Council. And in this session, I'm delighted to be joined in a one-to-one -one conversation with Dr. Kandi Yumkela. And we're going to discuss, again, this theme of humanising energy and what it means in particular for somebody who, has, who would describe themselves, I think, as a global energy activist, as somebody who's passionate about Africa's energy future, and as a Member of Parliament in Sierra Leone. Candy, it's really wonderful to see you again and welcome to World Energy Week Live. Let's start with a very easy question, which is what is your role and why is energy why does energy really matter to you? Thank you for having me, Angela. Um, I'm serving now as a member of parliament after almost 20 years at the United Nations. And um, of course, I spend my time as a parliamentarian representing 67,000 of the poorest, some of the poorest people in, in Sierra Leone. Wow. At the same time, I'm connected in many ways to all kinds of global initiatives in an advisory role. And why is energy important? It is exactly what I have said for 20 years. Energy, access to reliable, affordable energy is crucial for the achievement of the sustainable development goals, health, education, food security, gender empowerment, and so on. But it is also significant that without an energy revolution, we cannot solve climate change. Oh, you're, thank you. You're being very modest. You, you've, you've slipped in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I know you were incredibly active in shaping up the UN SDG Goal 7 on energy access. Yes, I spent 12 years advocating for what we used to call back in 2008, the missing Millennium Development Goals. Remember when they developed the Millennium Development Goals, no talk of energy. And two, three years into its implementation, we said, are you crazy? Can you have a well-running hospital without access to electricity, for diagnosis, for all kinds of things you need? for access to clean water. So we started global mobilization. And I was lucky in the sense that uh, Ban Ki-moon asked me then to lead UN Energy um, as chairman of UN Energy, 22 agencies, including the World Bank. And then later on, we started designing the Sustainable Energy for All SDG 7. So it was a huge global mobilization effort, a lot of institutions, NGOs. And what was significant, which is important for you, Angela, those who supported me the most were NGOs involved in social sector uh, activities, health, uh, food, women, education, water and sanitation, because they had all seen the importance of energy yeah. in implementing their activities at the poor community level. So it was a wonderful uh, global mobilization. And yes, we got SDG 7 established. Well, when we last met, we were, of course, at the African Energy in Darba in Cape Town in, in early March, and the world's changed since then. Uh, but we'd started the conversation then about humanising energy, this agenda that we're pushing at the World Energy Council. What does humanising energy mean for you? Humanising energy for me means energy as an enabler of human development. Um, at the UN, when I was leading sustainable energy for all at UN Energy, I always said that we wanted access to energy so that we can convert kilowatt hours to energy for real people. And I underlined real people. That it is the common man to have energy to be able, three light bulbs to see in the evening, extend their life for another three, four hours. I see that in my village. It is for the women in particular because it's the women who suffer. They're processing food. I mean, I give you an, a good case in my village. A woman works on the farm, comes back home by 2, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. She comes back with firewood on her head. Ah, she has to cook, inhaling fumes. If she didn't collect water in the morning, she has to go down to the river or to the well to collect water as well. Ah, they also process about 70% of the, agri the food agricultural products after they harvest on the farm. All of the phases, the processing stages require energy and it's all firewood. So for me, humanizing energy means giving people the opportunity to live a, a, a life of higher standard. They can have better uh, medical facilities. They can uh, uh, meet their sustainable livelihoods 
goals, meaning uh, what I said, energy for, for the agriculture, energy for the processing of agricultural products to take to market. It means uh, access to clean water and sanitation. Pumping that water, getting it into the homes, require an energy source. Now, health is important. My country has one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the world. Part of the cause is lack of blood when, when women hemorrhage during child, childbirth. Why do they have lack of blood? Because we cannot store the blood mm -hmm. regularly so that they have it when they need it. When they start bleeding, they call the relatives. Can somebody give blood quickly? So you begin to see that connection between lack of energy, lack of effective health service delivery, lack of higher incomes in the poor communities, lack of access to clean water, and of course, lack of motive power that can enhance their productivity in agriculture and in agribusiness. So humanizing energy is about hum human development. But of course, you know my big passion. It's about clean cooking as well. Mm -hmm. Saving the of 4 million people who die every year because of household air pollution. And the main cause of which is uh, a use of biomass, firewood, charcoal, and carbon. When people talk about um, the basic access energy gap, they often talk about Africa. But when we were in Africa, we were talking about the fact that Africa, and you've alluded to that already, faces multiple gaps, the clean cooking gap, the energy for health, the energy for education, the energy for better lives and new livelihoods. What, what frustrates you most about the, the, the focus in Africa on the basic access gap? What frustrates me, there are several things. One is, I don't believe our discussion of energy access in Africa really captures the urgency that I see because of demographic changes. Look, one out of every two people added to the population in the world now, one out of every two is African. The projections from the International Energy Agency are very clear. Africa will add about another billion people mm -hmm. by 2050. Africa has the highest urbanization rate now, 440 million people in urban areas. That is double what it was in, in 2000. But the projection is that it's going to double again by 2040. Mm -hmm. So what am I saying? People have to put the, the energy access needs of Africa in the context of that demographic projection. It also has to be in the context of the African Union Agenda 2063, which is looking at industrialization, mm -hmm. structural change in the economies, jobs for these youth, these one addition, one additional one billion people we're going to add by, by 2050. So if you put it in that context, you see that the energy transition in Africa means Africa needs to use all its energy resources now. 40% of the, of, of the gas discoveries from 2011 to about uh, uh, to, to now of the gas discoveries were in Africa. We have to see how we use gas in collaboration with solar and other renewable energy sources to be able to power the growth that we need to provide jobs and good well-being for the people of Africa. Also, we have to address the issue of clean cooking. With massive urbanization, what I see happening now, the forests are disappearing. Why? We have to supply wood and charcoal to the cities. In fact, in some parts of my country, it is more profitable to do firewood and charcoal than to do farming. Ha! Huh? But you're cutting down the trees. So these are uh, the urgency I don't see. The second thing is, I see these people create the false dichotomy that you have to talk about greed for now in Africa. No, it is greed and off-greed. We have to extend the greed, but I already know that my constituency, my village, will not see a power line until probably 30, 40 years from now. What we have now is our first mini grid, but that's in one village, one village with about 3,000 people. So it is on grid and off grid. And the third thing is, of course, the lack of attention to clean cooking. In Africa, about 850 million people now you rely on traditional biomass. All the projections I have seen from various institutions, that number will still be about 900 million by 2040. Can you just think about it, Angela? Mm -hmm. Pack cities, take, take Lagos, Nigeria. Imagine having 30, 40, 50 million Africans packed into Lagos 
relying still, most 80% of them relying on charcoal and firewood. The implications for the environment are huge. And last week, in collaboration with the University of Loughborough, World Bank, the Clean Cooking Alliance, these three institutions, I participated in an event last week where they launched a new report that in fact the cost to society now for lack of access to modern energy cooking services is two trillion per year. Wow. 1.2 trillion cost of health, one of the highest cost of mobility, for example, in Africa, but 0 0.8 trillion for women, for women. So if you are talking about women's empowerment, an inclusive society, if we don't bring our women in by giving them access to all kinds of energy services, as we look at industrialization and urbanization, let me give you another human element link, humanizing link. I read this morning, I was looking through some notes, something I had missed before. There will be about a billion Africans by 2040 mm -hmm. living in areas that are above 25 degrees centigrade, meaning they're going to need cooling services. Absolutely. Well, just think about it, the air conditioning needs, the refrigeration needs. So International Energy Agency already projects what happens by 2050, part of it will be led by Africa. But there's an opportunity. And you and I discussed that briefly in Cape Town. Africa can lead some of the new revolutions. Well, let me ask you, let me ask you, what, what can we learn from energy transition in Africa? You're talking very much from... You know, I spend a lot of conversations where people talk about the supply side conversation. How do we get clean generation? How do we produce more energy? How do we connect more people? But you're talking about users and uses and needs and this huge demand tsunami that's coming us, at us from Africa. How, what is it we can learn from the Africa energy transition? Well, one area that I see, and thanks to you, I participated in your energy in Daba in South Africa. And uh, I was enlightened because why? It is clear to me already that the South Africans can lead the hydrogen energy revolution. Okay. South Africa accounts for 70% of the platinum group of metals that are key for the hydrogen energy revolution. And I already see South African cons company consortiums already organizing themselves to look at that integration of solar power, big solar farms and wind together with uh, producing hydrogen energy. We can leave that. Second, so 70% uh, um, of the, about 50% of the cobalt in the world is in Central Africa, plus other minerals that you're going to need to move energy transitions in the rest of the world to cleaner, mm -hmm. cleaner energy sources. Battery technology. I see no reason why African countries are not talking to Elon Musk, for example to say, build your factories close to where the raw materials are for the new solar revolution, the new solar cities. So I can see Africans leading that. But we have an opportunity here for integrated solutions. And for me, when I say Africa needs all its energy resources, it is that integration that I want to see. But I see people coming to Africa to preach one technology. Mm -hmm. I think it is a disservice. No, we need all. And the projections already show. Even if we achieve universal access to energy by 2040, 2050. Our contribution to greenhouse gases will still be about 4%. So let the energy transition message not penalize Africa. Yeah. Let us help to use these technologies. In fact, use it as a laboratory to see how we can get more grid flexibility because we're building new grids, better efficient buildings because we have to build more cities given the urbanization. Another area is um, uh, mobility. With this massive urbanization, there are some projections that in fact our vehicle uh, uh, use will triple or quadruple. Isn't this an opportunity to begin to experiment with electric two-wheeler vehicles, three-wheeler vehicles, and four-wheeler vehicles? Because why? We can build the infrastructure from scratch. You're talking, that's, that sounds like a lot of leapfrog potential rather than catch-up potential. And that brings me back to the gaps conversation. You mentioned integration, but it's, it's, not, just the, it's not just the energy gaps. You'd ha have to have the digital gaps addressed, the health gaps addressed, the industrialization gaps addressed. How, what sort of policy innovation is coming out of Africa or do we need to see? Well, in fact, that last, that question you just asked is one of the issues I'm also advising the Friends of Europe and the EU Commission 
in, in a new energy task force we're setting up to look at that integration. Energy revolution or energy access, digitalization and agriculture and jobs. That is part of the way we feel that holistic look. So if we define this new partnership between Europe and Africa is in fact to look at that integration and it is important for Europe. Why? We are close to Europe. And I always say to my European friends, as you know, right now, you're talking to me in Europe. If we have that massive 1 billion people added by 2050 and we don't have jobs, our grandchildren move north. The closest place is Europe. So it's in an enlightened self-interest that in fact we integrate the energy, digitalization, jobs, and agriculture so that we create wealth and opportunity in Africa. To do that, indeed, you're right, we need policy innovations. We need for our leadership in Africa to understand what you and I are discussing, these linkages, that we're not talking about quick fixes. Mm -hmm. We're talking about energy policies that will be in place 30 years mm -hmm. that are well designed, which means you need data. And there's a lot of push now for more data for planning. Right. using all kinds of uh, spatial technologies and modeling. We need new business models. But I am convinced that we need to be frank and say we need subsidies for distributive energy. We need subsidies to have access to clean cooking solutions, subsidies that can be results-based, but let us not be scared to yeah. talk about subsidies. To build energy markets do not happen overnight. In a place like Africa with high risks, Entrepreneurs need support. Mm -hmm. Big companies need incentives to say, fine, we will come into a country, build an energy infrastructure, but we need to see policy stability and predictability. So yes, a lot of policy innovation, of course, the regulatory environment as well, which sometimes changes too fast for some investors to have confidence. A new government comes in, five years, they have a different mindset. No, and that, is, that has been the success of Ghana. Ghana has been consistent for 30 years. So they had 85% electrification. Rwanda is setting another example. They doubled, elect, more than doubled electrification within 10 years. Now they're moving first country to receive from what we've called the Clean Cooking Fund, mm -hmm. the first set of investment uh, 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 um, injection, almost a $20 million in, uh, in, uh, injection to help them create the markets for clean energy solutions. The other one is that uh, we need vegan solidarity. What you're trying to do now to bring industry and leaders together and we formed a new platform, what we call the Health and Energy Platform for Action, right. uh, um, where we're trying to bring yourselves and others in to say, how do we work together and do this sector coupling of energy solutions to deliver better health service? And COVID-19 has even made that even more important today. Second, how do we do uh, work, learn from some of the innovations in the health sector in social mobilization as well, to bring these energy solutions yeah. to human energy, as you say, and help the common man. That's a long-standing agenda here at the World Energy Council, what I'd call the join the dots, join the dots agenda, understanding that energy is ultimately a connector, and it's the yes. health of the connections that really matter. And to do yes. that, we have to, of course, convene the energy plus community because it's not about energy it's about what energy brings into the lives of everyone so here we are world energy week live and the theme is connecting energy societies so what is it about connecting energy societies that we should take away from the africa perspective you know who's where where are the connections in energy society in african energy societies that we most need to work on um, we need to work on policymakers still. As I said, they don't have their energy narratives right yet. People still think it is only when you cut a ribbon at a power plant that, is, that, that means you're working on energy access. No, there are many other dimensions. So we need the policymakers, we need the parliamentarians. I'm, I'm also collaborating with the IMF World Bank uh, Post-COVID Recovery Parliamentary Forum. I am also working on, with the Climate Parliament trying to bring the energy message and to a certain extent the energy transition message with parliamentarians. But then we need the civil society groups. We need for people to understand that it is energy plus. Mm -hmm. It is sector coupling. Uh, because sometimes we just take it for granted, ah, switch the light on. Or we say, okay, just get a generator. Mm -hmm. We don't think about building ecosystems for finance that will empower energy access, finance that will empower consumer demand on the other side. 
to be able to acquire technologies that can use the energy, as you, as you and I were discussing. It's about using the energy to improve livelihoods, to improve, improve welfare, and also push uh, uh, sustainable economic growth that are in the 7% range. That is important for Africa. Let me ask, this is, I'm going to go close to the bone now. Let me ask about questions of humility. People in finance aren't experts in energy. People in energy aren't experts in health. People in health aren't experts in energy. How do we get, how do we really get leaders actively listening and learning with and from each other? Very difficult. I, uh, I spent what, about 10 years, 12 years in the UN building those coalitions. Then you can say the moment was right. I had a lot of leaders around the world uh, that were ready to be part of that revolution. Real big guys, presidents, and, and, and Ban Ki-moon and, uh, uh, and um, President Kim at the World Bank were willing to bring their convening power together. We're trying to build a similar coalition now for what we call the Health and Energy Platform for Action. We just have to keep doing it. And I think, I see a, a little silver lining that COVID-19 already shows how interconnected we are. Mm -hmm. That in fact, in Africa, before we had the first case in March, April, we already had the economic impacts because supply chains were disrupted in the rest of the world. So immediately we got the impact. Now it also showed how quickly pandemics can spread. Well, if pandemics, according to the scientists, are going to be our future, we better collaborate now to make sure countries have the capacity to deal with it, which means economic improvements, structural change in the economies, but also a transition mm -hmm. to universal access to energy, energy security. You used to call it a trilemma, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. A, 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 a few years ago, thanks to you guys again at the World Energy Council, we used to advocate for the trilemma. So again, you've been consistent in talking about bringing communities together, societies together, to collaborate. Because yes, there is a little bit more silo mentality. Sometimes it's also hubris. Those who have money are holding back and saying, well, we know what to do. Talk to the energy experts. Look at opportunities. We, 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 we also need to bring civil society. They have to understand what they should demand from their governments and their leadership. If they don't demand more and demand innovative thinking for the urgency that I see on demographics, it will be business as usual. Incremental changes, small steps that will break a, a, a big crisis in, a, in another 10, 20 years. Thank you, Candy. Thank you so much for being with us as part of World Energy Week Live and for reinforcing the message of connecting energy societies that there is a role, not just for business and governments, for civil societies, that countries, companies and communities together have to address this join the dots agenda and ensure that the health of connections enabled by energy are a benefit for everyone and particularly the most vulnerable in society. It's a pleasure to talk to you again and I am sure the world will continue to be energised by the Candy Yum Keller effect everywhere. Thank you, Candy, and I hope we can meet in person soon. We'll do our best. Thank you so much for having me. Angela and uh, Dr. Candy, thank you very much indeed for uh, an excellent one-to-one uh, -one discussion. Um, I think what we managed to get out of uh, a very in-depth overview was an awful lot more about what we mean by Angela's comment about humanizing energy. I think Dr. Candy really brought that home in the context of the real examples of what access to energy can do to change lives, not just today, but as he said, importantly for us to recognize a billion new citizens in Africa will arrive in the years ahead. And we have to think about the way energy systems will evolve to accommodate that. The new jobs will be required, new ways of working will be required, and it's unsustainable for us to think, as he said, thinking about a city like Lagos with 30 to 40 million people potentially using charcoal and firewood as the main source for cooking food as we go forward in the years ahead. And I think this brings alive the requirements for what we need to think about humanizing energy. The other aspect that I took away from that was also, uh, as Dr. Candy mentioned, sector 
decoupling. I know from my own experience, when I've had the opportunity to work with various governments, it's difficult to get, let's say, the Minister of Energy to work with the Ministry of Industry, with Finance, etc., and Agriculture. And he made it extraordinarily clear the importance to get that connected thinking if we are genuinely to move the energy agenda forward for these new populations uh, that will arrive. So I hope all of you were able to get something very personal from that as well as directional in terms of what we can do.